please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists, Mr. Klingler, Dr. Mintz, Ms. Patton, and Dr. Schubert. Let me, uh, let me ask each of you to talk uh, a bit and, and be as expansive as you like. We have time and we're happy to hear you all drill down into great detail about the things that put you on this panel. And I'm going to begin with uh, Dr. Mintz since the edX partnership still has the ink, dr uh, the ink is still drying on the edX partnership. And I think many of us in, uh, who pay attention to higher ed in Texas are still learning about this, learning the details of it. And I gather that this phrase MOOC, Massive Online Open, Massive Open Online or Online Open Courses, is going to be something that now just falls into the lexicon. This is really at the, uh, at the heart of the work that edX does. Would you talk about it and how the partnership came to be, please? Okay, first let me just say one thing that I do in my spare time. I have a website called Digital History, and it has 250,000 users a week. Now, actually that 250,000 is a, is a minimum because it's 250,000 separate IP addresses. So multiple people may be right. watching on one right. terminal. So it's, so it's, yeah. And it's mainly teachers and students. Right. So, uh, you know, I've sold a lot of books in my life and nothing approaching what sees that website in a single week, hmm. right? We now have it within our power to give every student in Texas and elsewhere access to an elite caliber education. Michael Sandell at Harvard has 900 students in his quote unquote face-to-face -face class at Harvard that they don't actually have a room big enough for 900 students. Even at Harvard. Even at Harvard, so they're watching it on a screen. Right. right. And in the fall, you can take his course, right? Just like a Harvard student, and you will pay zero, right? And that's not with financial aid. And we now will be able to deliver University of Texas courses <coughs> for free to a worldwide market. Tomorrow I'll be at MD Anderson and one of the classes that we're considering is cancer diagnoses, for example. In other words, you're going to have access both to what we'll call centers of excellence courses, courses taught by Nobel laureates, and you will have access to what I'll call gateway courses. These are those basic building block courses that we think are as they say, best in class. And you can take those for free. Now, if you want credit, you're going to pay for them. But we think everybody should have a right to that kind of education. Mm -hmm. This, we think, is truly transformative. We're going to target high school students and others in, in part of a consortium with community colleges and other universities in Texas because we want to make sure that every Texan, wherever they live, rural or urban, yep. southwest, north or east, has the same kind of access to a high quality education and it's not going to be a correspondence course. Yep. It's not just going to be seen a talking head. It's going to have all kinds of interactivity. What is the cost from the University of Texas system standpoint in participating in this partnership? Okay, we paid, or I would say invested, $5 million in the software platform. If we were to develop that platform, I can assure you, it would have cost us way more than $5 million. Right. These are extraordinarily expensive and to And for that $5 million, you're getting what? I don't mean to seem so ungracious, we because have, it sounds like the work is really important. We have the software for? code, which we actually have right at this moment. Yeah. Uh, so if we were to drop out of edX, we would still have the software code. This code has extremely sophisticated, what are called learning analytics. That is, it's not simply we know when students got on the site and left the site. We know every answer that they had, which ones were wrong, how many students had it wrong. So we're able to diagnose where students have weaknesses and then automatically target those students for remediation in precisely the areas where they're having problems. This is, we call it personalized adaptive yeah. learning. It is really and, and there's no revenue for the university, as you say, unless somebody wants to get credit for it. Correct. Course. So you're doing something for the right reasons, not just to make money. How refreshing. 
We think it is really An worthwhile. Thing. We think it's the future. Right. And we want to be there. Now, Mr. Klingler, uh, Western Governors University is now, I think of the state as having six university systems, but in fact, now Western Governors often gets added on as the last car on the train. Uh, has a, a serious presence in Texas. In fact, on November 10th, just had your first graduation ceremony. Mm -hmm. Um, would you educate people here for the benefit of, uh, of this audience, which may not know as much about what Western Governors is and intends to be? Can you say a few words about what it is, please? Sure. And uh, on behalf of, of uh, Chancellor Millarn, thank you for inviting us to participate today. Sure. Yeah, I represent WGU Texas. Western Governors University was formed uh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, by the Western Governors Association, 19 governors, including the governor of Texas, uh, to provide additional educational capacity to uh, educate the workforce uh, needs in their states. So WGU has been, a, has been operating on a national level, including students in Texas, for 15 years. And uh, as you say, a year ago, we formed, uh, 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 by decree of Governor Perry, WGU Texas. Uh, we now have a uh, state chancellor. We have, uh, I think, about 125 staff in the state and growing. We have over 3,000 uh, uh, Texas students within the state and growing. Uh, we just had our first official WGU Texas commencement with 400 graduates, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, uh, there's a, a lot of power behind that. There, why, why create the state uh, uh, campus? Well, the kind, kind of coordination that's happening now within the state that uh, Chancellor Millarn is, is leading and the coordination with the uh, with, uh, legislators, with the uh, Higher Education Coordinating Board, with the community colleges and the universities, with the employers, uh, with our advisory board. Uh, the effect we're having by having this incredible team on the ground in the state yep. is very powerful and it's allowing us to have a, a greater impact. And how it works is a student wants to take a course of study and there are particular courses of study. It's not essentially a full menu, it's a select menu, right? So one of the foundational uh, principles of WGU is that when a student enrolls for a given degree, uh, the entire degree plan is prescribed. There are no electives. We have uh, national advisory boards that are, uh, consist of academic and or workforce leaders. Yep. And they've identified what the requirements are to meet both uh, accreditation as well as workforce needs. And so we prescribed all those courses. The student can affect how fast they proceed. They can sometimes affect what order they go in, but we have identified for them every course they need to complete to graduate. It's competency-based, so we recognize that every student comes to us already knowing different things yep. and prepared to move at their own pace. So at a course level within the university, every course is essentially personalized and adapted. The student takes a pre-assessment. We identify which learning objectives or topics they already demonstrate mastery of, which ones they still need to learn. And we then guide them through a personalized learning experience that includes both online materials and one-on-one -on -one instruction with, with faculty to prepare them then to demonstrate that they know and can do every competency associated with each course through uh, secure performance uh, summative assessments. And again, like the edX courses, these courses are taken at your uh, in, your own pub in your own physical space, right, in your own private space, on your own device. They are, and, and part of uh, what's wonderful about the attention the MOOCs have currently, actually in a yeah. lot of ways it's a wonderful validation of what we right. are doing because uh, part of the leverage that we get at WGU that's really essential to our mission of keeping high quality education affordable and accessible, we don't have uh, 900, we call them mentors, creating their own versions of courses. We've centralized that, yep. and part of how we do that is we go and we find the very best courseware, best instructional material available. Sometimes it's from other universities, sometimes that, it's from did commercial you say cor publishers. courseware? Is that a, is that a, a phrase that, so it, within online education, that's a common phrase, courseware? In the past, it used to be that um, all you could do is go and con you know, buy the books from the publishers, and yeah. you relied on a faculty member to turn that into a course. Yep. Well, increasingly, the publishers are recognizing the writing is on the wall. The day of the, of the printed, printed book text. is over. Right. So to remain viable and competitive, they're essentially doing what the universities do. They're creating very compelling courseware. And they're doing it much like edX and the, the MOOCs. They are providing the technology enablement that no individual faculty member or very few institutions could do on their own. Highly adaptive, immersive, authentic, experiential 
uh, learning experiences, yeah. continuously diagnostic on an increasing basis, and they are putting together essentially a complete course. Now each institution that adopts that course can tailor it and adapt it, and we do that as well, make it appropriate to our students, make sure it has all the coverage we need for our competencies. Mm -hmm. But increasingly now, we can actually uh, license and contract for uh, very comprehensive courseware that very, uh, mm. in a very sophisticated manner covers the course objectives. And so if I'm a WGU student and I decide to enroll, what would it cost me for a year compared to a bricks and mortar institution? This is one of the, the really wonderful things about the WGU model. At WGU, we charge for time, not per credit hour, or as we refer to it, competency unit. Um, our tuition is $28.90 per six months, and the student can complete as much as, as they're capable of. If they're motivated and they have time available, they can move really fast. Uh, the, the standard is 12 CU per term. That's our minimum standard to remain in good standing. Uh, we have students who go much faster than that. Uh, most, stand, most students move at about that pace. Yep. And that price actually includes all the learning resources, the books, the courseware, the labs, um, fees that students are accustomed to paying in turn, addition turn to, their, key, to their tuition. That's included, with, there is a, with tuition, there's a $150 material fee, resource fee, that covers uh, a lot of things. It, it, it covers just a fraction of that cost. We recognized two years ago that not all students were buying and using the materials. And that really goes to two things. One is uh, we serve, uh, about 70% of our students fall into one of four underserved uh, populations, including low income. So quite often they're avoiding the cost. Nobody likes paying for books. And in other situations, at the point in time where the student needs that material, it's not convenient to get it immediately. If they go online and order that book, they might wait several days. Right. So we wanted to solve those, make sure there was never a cost barrier, never an access barrier. So we took on as an institution the cost of all those materials, and we went entirely to e-books that are available on, uh, on your phone, your tablet, your computer, right, right there. any web browser, wherever the student is, online or offline, now whenever they have a study opportunity, they can engage and they can learn, and they don't even know what it costs or when they're incurring the cost, which is really uh, goes to a bigger discussion, but that's really a powerful thing in terms of getting the students to actually engage in the material that they need. And not be worried about the other stuff. Yep. Right. Uh, uh, on the subject of converting to phones and, and devices and what have you, uh, we have the, you know, the Apple computer case study or role model nationally here with us uh, in Dr. Schubert. You've now been at this for more than four years, have you not? We have. It was about yeah. four years ago. That how, did that, how did that relationship come about? And talk about the contours of it. I described <laughs> it in general, but talk about it specifically. You know, I, th I think we were, uh, we were seeing, as, as we all have been seeing, the, the way in which our students of today are changing. Uh, the, the nature of the, the world that they live in, the connected mentality. I heard something the other day, you guys have seen all these stats and probably heard this one, but I, it was new for me that in a week's time frame, there's more content uploaded, new content uploaded to YouTube than if NBC, ABC, and CBS have been broadcasting continuously 24-7, 365 since 1965. In, in one, one, week, week, one week's time. In one week. And so I think the recognition, as we several years ago, were, were in, and that necessarily wasn't, wasn't the, the, uh, the primary headline then, but the reality is our students were showing up with different propensities. And, and that impacted the learning environment. Yep. Uh, add to that a number of the things that are, have been pervasive throughout the conversations of this day, uh, issues of affordability, uh, the idea that can technology be an enabler in, in reducing cost and expanding or even enhancing the learning environment, access is certainly uh, an issue as well. The gentleman who asked the question before our, our lunch se session that was a higher education researcher, he talked about the, the, uh, the, the changing nature of the workforce and projections for the percentage, at least in Texas, of the population that will need certificates or degrees uh, by 2040. And if you back that up, what's changing are the expectations on universities and those of us who are in the business of preparing the workforce of tomorrow. And I would argue what's shifting most of that is technology and the yep. way in which our environment and society is, is changing. So I guess all those in some shape or form, among other things, were catalysts for us to begin thinking about what can we do to reimagine the classroom in the 21st century? We had uh, some great scholars on our campus who were passionate about this issue, several of our faculty members who authored a white paper. They basically described the future that didn't exist. This was prior to the iPhone, okay? The iPhone was a rumor only, didn't have a name. There was a device that Apple was coming out with 
Uh, and, and these guys were, were basically anticipating what we might have in terms of capability, internet in your pocket, if you will, and all that could be done that's different than what we've done for 500 years in higher education. So they put together a white paper, sold the administration on the fact that there's opportunity here. It was different than a traditional laptop initiative, offered significant uh, mobility and all kinds of different opportunities to change the way we teach. And it just so happened, or, and we made a video. It was a hypothetical day in the life of an ACU student in the 21st century classroom, which really garnered more <laughs> attention and it communicated because people could watch it and yeah. see. And they said, oh my goodness, there are things that are going to be available now that have never been. So did you send this off to Apple and say, you know, we actually didn't. We had a contact uh, at Apple um, who got a hold of it uh, by happenstance and then forwarded it to his colleagues. And then we were invited to come out to Cupertino and <coughs> spend a day talking with the, the brass at Apple because they were taken back by the, the vision that our folks had put together. And so we spent a day brainstorming. Yeah. From there, things began to unfold. and. We began four years ago, as you noted, uh, issuing every freshman their choice of either an I iPhone, they have to pay the contract, or they did, uh, or an iPod Touch. So that actually answers the contract. question. So you're providing the device. We provide the device. They have to pay for the service. But did Apple provide the device to the university, or is the university paying for the devices? No. Uh, if you've ever negotiated with Apple, you know that they absolutely do not negotiate. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you're, paying, so you're buying it. We're buying them. And, right. So and do you have a sense of what the aggregated cost of this is for you to do Sure. This? It's uh, been right at a million dollars a year. Um, but the benefits, seem, that seems well, like that very much What we're obviously relevant. trying to create is an environment yeah. that celebrates and rewards innovation, creativity, makes it OK for but we, we called it a phase of wild experimentation. Right. And we had to condition our faculty prior to the announcement to do that. We, we implemented a class at a time, so it, we didn't give all 4,500 students iPhones on the beginning of the fall semester. We phased in the freshmen and sophomores and juniors. But in advance of that, we conditioned our faculty. We invested in facilities and additional training resources and made it voluntary to, to say, hey, we want to help you. We want to provide project consulting. Uh, we provided stipends for research. Uh, we called them our mobile learning fellows. And they had the opportunity to uh, submit proposals for, here's what I'd like to try in my classroom. Right. And we gave uh, funds to help support that. So what I mentioned was meal balances and homework alerts and what have you. But are, is there a, an application in the classroom oh, for absolutely. things like course materials, yeah. syllabi? Sure. Textbooks. I, I was amused by the list. I was going to note that the, the homework alert overloaded our network because we were sending, no, not really, but the, yeah. your, your homework is late. So everything from as simple as an attendance roster with pictures, right. because on our campus, the, the personal interaction, faculty and student is a big deal. And so we put picture rosters for attendance that the faculty member could stand up in front of the class and just uh, note which students were not there uh, by, by touching their, their picture which uploaded to their gradebook, something simple as that, and the other things you mentioned, uh, to highly interactive applications in the classroom. So a professor can, from his or her iPhone, in the middle of class, uh, with a little bit of advanced preparation, launch a, a survey immediately to the class. Let's take four questions on chapter four of microbiology. I want to see if you mastered the, the concepts here. And we'll, we'll judge that by these four questions. Every student in the class is able to to participate, the professor gets immediate feedback on whether or not the class as a whole has mastered those concepts or if there's a particular area that you know, maybe half seem to be struggling. It also provides an opportunity for students to ask questions via their phone, which for the student who wants to sit in the back of the room on the corner and be invisible, it provided a way for interaction for us to draw students into the discussion when they may not have felt comfortable as a freshman standing up and saying, hey, I've got a question. I didn't quite understand this. So yeah. that's to give you there are plenty more from the, you know, uh, the flip learning model, which I think most of you have probably heard, where podcasts, many of our professors uh, were making their own podcasts, saying at home, you watch the podcast, you come to class, we're going to deal with the application. Talk about the application. So a whole host of, of applications. Absolutely there. fascinating. And, and Ms. Patton, Cisco in this relationship is the Apple right, to ACU's being on the receiving end, right? You are the providers of technology to a lot of schools. Um, I'm assuming that you're not giving it away either. I wouldn't say that we're the Apple. <laughs> okay, well, but we and, love all these technologies. And big air quotes, you're the <laughs> Apple of this, right? But, but so talk about, how, talk about how you all approach this from the vendor standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, all of these technologies are so exciting to us because we provide the enabling um, technology to support them. Yeah. So the core underlying infrastructure, the route, routing and switching capabilities, and increasingly 
um, video communications collaboration. Yeah. So it's really exciting to hear all of these technologies taking off. And I think we are, we are in the midst of this um, major inflection point, the sea change that we all referenced. And uh, we just know that if those devices go out on campuses and the, the network is not in place, stable, secure, reliable, yeah. um, that those devices won't work. Um, online learning won't work. The, the rich, robust video that we're seeing, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, so so that we really kind of, we, traditionally we've played in the core underlying infrastructure, the route switch. Increasingly, um, we're providing, in, uh, enabling technologies for things like online learning, um, so when you look at online learning and being able to do WebEx conferencing or telepresence, um, communication and collaboration with university leaders. So being able to have telepresence units on their desk so that they can connect and communicate more frequently and effectively. And we believe that that in turn, uh, when you increase the connections, you accelerate innovation because you're really putting people together so that they can communicate um, more effectively. How, how much of this is Cisco innovating and going to the universities and saying, here are all these cool things that we can do, and how much of it is universities essentially whiteboarding how they'd like to transform education and coming to you and saying, build this? I would say the latter. So yeah. our customers really inform us. Um, and so, you know, we have the traditional technologies, but a perfect example is West Texas A&M, for example. Um, and so they, you know, we work in very close partnership with them, and our customers really give us the use cases. They so say, what do you do for, what do you do for, this is a school in Canyon, right? Uh, yeah, yes. Yes, yes. So that's, um, for them, they started out with, uh, of course, the core foundation and the infrastructure, um, but then they implemented a, a pervasive video approach. And so when you talk about flip learning and pervasive um, video, teachers being able to, to do you know, podcast video recordings, um, they have all of that plus the data analytics built into the video, which is really exciting. When you're able to look at a video and a student who's struggling with a concept like osmosis, and they can do a search on the video to find all of the mentions of osmosis in the lecture. Right. So those, they, they started out with that, with digital media signage. Um, and then they really moved into data center consolidation and virtualization. So you look at being able to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of the infrastructure and being able to reuse um, endpoint devices. Um, one uh, sort of fun story, when we were at Educause, not this past show, but the last year, we were there with West Texas A&M, and they were doing some press interviews with us. And one of the, uh, Dr. Diarno, Diarmond, a finance professor, actually looked at his watch and he said, you know, it's time. It's almost time for my um, finance class that I have to give. And he said, I I'd like to do. I'd like to do it via WebEx um, from the trade show floor, and being able to show students that he could really deliver that class anytime, anywhere, from any device, and right. then the students could access and consume that uh, content as well. What's amazing that I'm hearing across this is, you know, we, we now live in a world where the consumption of media is on demand. Right? We've moved away from having to watch television at a particular time on a particular channel on that particular box to now having access to that content on almost any device at almost any time. It's really an on-demand society now. And it sounds like education may be moving in that direction. In that, Dr. Mintz and Mr. Klingler, the courses that you're talking about, I imagine, can be taken at 11 o'clock in the morning, fully dressed, or 11 o'clock at night in my pajamas. They can be taken at a Starbucks with headphones on. They can be taken in my basement. They can be taken in a more traditional setting, it really doesn't make a difference. You're creating, Dr. Mintz, an on-demand uh, an, an on version of education. I'm not the director of online education. I'm the director of transformational learning. And hmm. my interest is not in how students consume knowledge. I want to transform students into creators of knowledge. But you accept that those and things are related, And they have those though, tools right? yeah. in their hands now yeah. that allow them to do things that were previously inconceivable. Let me just give you a few examples. Yeah. They have a recorder in their hands, and they can go out and do oral histories in ways that were impossible. Right. I have my students go to museums, and they do virtual tours. They do the audio tours that museums have these days. Or I have them uh, annotate maps in order to create, uh, you know, in Columbia we did every neighborhood in New York and they embedded oral histories and photographs and all kinds of data into those maps. These are long-term projects that are public, yep. that are deeply meaningful. 
This transforms education from the industrial model, which is me transmitting a fixed body of information to you, to an information age model in which you and I are collaborators yep. in creating knowledge. That seems to me a fundamental disruptive transformation in the whole notion of education. Yeah. And that's what I want to promote. And of course it benefits, uh, Mr. Klingler, it benefits Dr. Mintz in what he's doing at edX and what you're doing at Western Governors is that a lot of the new students, the kids today, this generation, comes to the table practically with USB ports in the sides of their heads. <laughs> they, they have grown up in a world in which they, this is second nature to them. They only know computers and Facebook and Twitter and iChatting and gchatting and file sharing. They don't have to learn this technology. In some ways, they come in the door knowing more than you all know about its application. That's got to be a help. Well, actually, uh, let me expand on that. Uh, we, we don't serve your traditional 18 to 25 year old student. Our average student in Texas is 38 years old. In ah. fact, 35% of our students are over 40, 10% are over 50. So they're probably not as comfortable with the technology as their kids but are. But increasingly, actually, they are. They are. The society has moved that way. Who doesn't have a smartphone? Who isn't on Facebook? It, it wasn't that long ago we had to teach them how to use a mouse, yep. and, and we don't anymore. That standard has moved. The consumer, the student, is demanding these new modes of delivery. They're not satisfied with reading a static textbook. They want that experiential learning. They want yep. something that's more immersive, that's available wherever they are. If they can read a, their, their Kindle book on any device and pick up a different device and it remembers where they were, they want their academic book to work the same way. If they can make an annotation in one place, they expect it everywhere. If they can share it with others, they expect that. If they can watch YouTube from anywhere, they expect to watch the, the videos. So uh, really, this, the, the, the uh, adoption of modern technology into society in general is dragging higher ed along with it because the students expect it right. and they're ready for it. Right, to that point, Ms. Patton, you know, higher ed is no different than a lot of traditional institutions in that it can be hidebound. And it can be resistant to change, it can be slow to change when it acknowledges that change is necessary. And it may not be mechanically situated to change, you know, in a graceful way, right? All of a sudden, universities are getting religion. I mean, it is the sense that this is all happening. It didn't literally happen overnight, but it feels like we couldn't even have been having this conversation three years ago. And now it's, well, of course we do all these things and nobody can believe it. Have you encountered with the universities that you do business with that fear is the motivator or is it proactivity? <laughs> <laughs> how, how much of this is universities scared to death that they're so far behind that they've got to play catch up, and how much of it is people who are truly visionary and innovative in the way that they approach this? That's a great question, and I think it, it really depends on who they are. Um, it depends on their brand. Right. It depends on the segment of students they're serving. Um, there are some customers who come through who have these amazing brands, and you know, two or three years ago, they would say, we have no interest in changing. We don't care what's happening with technology. We have our brand, our students right. will, come to us regardless of where we're located, where they're located. Um, so, you know, over time, they've come to the realization that they may not want to change, but students are forcing the change. So whether yeah. they're, you know, younger students and you know, millennials or the older students who need more flexibility, they're, I think they're finally coming to say, okay, we have no choice but to change. Yeah. And so I think there is a good dose of fear. Right, but I'm just, I hear you reference as your, as your example, West Texas A&M. I mean, goodness gracious. Well, he, he was visionary. This, but this yeah, is not, this is, if you would ask me any yeah. campus in the state that would yeah. be Cisco's case study yeah. for technological proactivity <laughs> and sophistication, yeah. it would have taken me a long time yeah. to get down the list to get to West Texas, West yeah. Texas A&M. So they're a great example. I mean, they're a great reference um, case, but there are a number, number of them. I mean, so again, you kind of look at the ones who they sort of have their brand, they're a little bit slower to change. Then there are just those universities where they do have visionaries, like right. West Texas A&M, like Duke University, um, and they are they are visionaries about technology, uh, about where they think technology should go. They are absolutely passionate about it, right. and they have ideas about what to do. So there, I think there are a significant number um, of those. Let me give an example of uh, one okay. of these of one of these yeah. things at UT Arlington. I attended a class. Half the students are in Arlington and half of the students are in Western Siberia. They're using WebEx. And the Russian students speak in English, and the American students speak in Russian. 
and for many students who are never going to go on a study abroad experience, and especially not to Western Siberia, I can assure you, <laughs> yeah. this is a transformative learning experience. And this is now possible. Something that was never possible yeah. until, very, until very recently. Could I just tie a couple of these things together and also that. link to the, uh, the prior discussion around cost? One of the really fascinating things that, uh, that we are uh, capturing right now, we redid the business model with the publishers this year. And uh, there are a lot of reasons there we could go into, but put simply, we recognized that uh, as we took on the responsibility to pay for the, the, the books and the courseware, that became a very big expense very quickly. Yep. And we needed to manage that cost, but it also, more than anything, we needed to know that the materials were effective and being used by the students, that they were meeting the students where the students are. So we actually dreamed up an entirely different business model, and it wasn't easy, but we got our partners to agree to it. And now um, we have not only lowered costs significantly, but we've changed the way that the publishers are motivated. They don't get paid just because a student opened the book. We don't pay unless a student actually meaningfully used the book. And in an increasing number of cases, the publisher isn't paid unless the student actually passes the course and meaningfully right. used their courseware. Well, this is Dan Branch's whole outcomes-based funding model that he's talked it, about in the legislature. It is, and yeah. it's pushing it downstream to where it's effective because what you have happening now is our collaboration is entirely student success centric. The publishers aren't interested in, oh, should I you know, version this book, release a new edition in order to obsolete the, the used book market? They are looking at it with us. The only way to make more money is to get students to actually engage in and use their materials and right. pass our assessments. They don't control the assessments we do. So they are working on making the courseware more interesting, more engaging. More customer service Why do the focused. students stop halfway through a module? Well, it probably got pretty boring or tedious or it lost them. Right. And so the, the type of collaboration and the interest in that is really a pretty powerful motivator. That's, that's actually a great point. Uh, Dr. Schubert, I have a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old. They have devices, of course, because whose kids don't? And I'm thinking that if they were permitted to have their phones in class, they'd be playing words with friends, and they'd be on iTunes, and they'd be doing all the things that they could possibly imagine. They would not be checking their meal balances, I assure you. So I'm or certain their homework that you, alerts. Or doing their homework alerts. Well, I'm assuming that you've anticipated in this that you've basically handed the tools of Satan. <laughs> Which at Abilene Christian University. Which is a big I'm about deal. to say it is. Yeah. <laughs> you, brought, you brought it up, not me. <laughs> well, the governor told me about two months ago Satan exists, so I actually think this is a pretty important conversation to have. Uh, 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 you have essentially handed the tools of Satan to 18 year olds and said, go, yeah. go forth and do your evil business. Yeah, so I mean, so it's, it's the, no, it's, it's the either ignore the tidal wave yeah. or embrace it and surf it. Right. And we decided to embrace it and surf it. And so the, the kids are going to, you can't, on a college campus, the day and age, maybe there's some universities out there, but to take an approach of you can't bring your phone to class, yeah. that doesn't fly. Yeah. Uh, that's not our society. That's the not the word. Right. You're behind the time. So yeah. the other alternative is you have it, but we're going to use it productively. And we're going to use it significantly enough that you're not going to be sitting there with your phone in your hand without something going on that maybe yeah. relates to your phone. We have over 90% of our faculty respond that they use the devices in their classroom regularly. 50% that they use them almost daily. Yeah. So we're, we're finding, and, and by the way, our faculty have responded, which this has been an issue. We've talked about it significantly. Some, we have some very outspoken critics who would just, on our faculty, who would say this is crazy, just as you articulated. Uh, but over 90% of our faculty have responded that what we've done has been productive and they're supported and it's been a good movement forward. Yeah. I can't get 90% of my faculty. To I agree anything, I gonna, right? I'd give them a 10% raise and I'd have half of them who would think it would bankrupt us so they'd vote no. Right. But to get that kind of agreement right. uh, and to get the kind of response from students which they respond, I'm more engaged. The collaboration in class is, yeah. more, is more rich. I communicate more effectively with my professor. And I'm more expedient in being able to complete my assignments because of having this device. What about the parents of these students? Do the parents of your students object in any way? They, I thought I was sending my kid to a traditional you know, higher ed institution, and now suddenly they're handing them out iPads, I, iPhones, or iTouch. Yeah, as a college president, uh, you get everything in the book. So anything comes across my desk. And it, but the majority of people know. I think they recognize right. that we're trying to take aggressive steps 
toward educating students to be successful in the world that they're going to graduate into. And it's, it's not a put your head in the sand, it's an embrace the kind of skills that students are going to need to compete in a global and connected workforce. And so, uh, I, for, for the most part, very, very positive feedback. I've got a few minutes before I want to open it up to questions. This has been a fantastic discussion. I want to thank you so much for that. But I want to ask you about two of the knocks on the move to more online focused education and ask you in sort of jump balls to respond to this. Uh, State Representative Debbie Riddle from Houston, um, who is often outspoken on many subjects, if you cover the legislature, you know her. Uh, yesterday, um, gave an interview in which she complained about the move to online courses and to the introduction of technology as a more regular fact of life um, uh, in higher ed. And she was actually speaking about pub public ed and higher ed, that it somehow dehumanized the experience of going to school, that it somehow imper made it impersonal, that the relationship between the student and the teacher in class, whether it's in public ed or higher ed, is a foundational piece of education and that by allowing for the edX type class or the Western Governors type class or introducing technology as a barrier almost between that in, or within that intimate relationship that somehow something significant is being lost. The socialization aspect of education which is such an important part of the on-campus experience say, is somehow being stripped by the introduction of this technology. Would any of you like to respond to that? I'd like to. Um, data point to kick that off. Um, Currently, uh, each month, our 900 mentors conduct more than 250,000 phone calls with our 38,000 students. So they are having an in-person experience. These are one-to-one on -one yeah. interactions, giving guidance and, and, and instruction on an individual basis based on where that student is and the pace that they're ready to move. So they have the ability to engage the online materials independently, right. but they also have this incredible support of fully qualified faculty that work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Our students have more one-on-one -on -one faculty interaction than I ever had. And I think most students in the lecture hall never take the opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Most online schools, it's common that your attendance requirement is postings in an online message board. At WGU, our attendance requirement is a little bit different. You must speak on the phone with your mentor every week. And if you're doing really well, that can slide to every other week. So our, our interaction between faculty and students is a little bit different. Yep. We also do have online communities, and it's actually an area that um, we're, we're constantly looking for innovative ways to improve it and enhance it. There are places there within the courses and within the programs and, and campus in general where students can interact with each other. We have learning communities. We separately have social communities. Both are used for different purposes. Right. I think that's an emerging field. I think there's, there will be tremendous advancement and progress in that social interaction online over the next few years, but I think um, the perception that that doesn't exist online is, is uh, just not fully informed. Uh, uh, Dr. Manis, the, this depersonalization of education is not, not as much of a problem, you think? Life is trade-offs, right? Every gain is a loss, every loss is a gain. And what we're able to do is to move things to be more efficient. What we want professors to do are high-impact, high-touch practices. That means working really closely with students in, for example, freshman research experiences. If we want to do that, we've got to move other stuff online to do it more efficiently. Yep. And so it's this mixture that we're seeing. Also, we're able to connect students in new ways. All of you, as adults, know that professional networks are the way of the world. You have people you can call upon for advice, you are people you can call upon for connections, and we're creating those knowledge networks, even among undergraduates, who are going to be able to draw on those in the future. Who, after all, live their whole lives in right. networks now, right. Right? right? Whether it's Twitter or Instagram or anything else that might be might be out there. The, the second knock on this uh, uh, is that somehow, that it's, often it's um, uh, uh, derided as distance learning is sort of the the, the way that they slag this is that somehow it's not academically rigorous enough, that somehow we're letting our students off the hook with this kind of material. That you know, by introducing technology in there again, interposing technology between the teacher and the student, that somehow the class is never going to be as rigorous as it would be if it were in person, and therefore you're just allowing kids to skate through and get degrees. Uh, Dr. Schubert, is that your, is that your view? Oh, not at all. I, it reminds me, this whole discussion reminds me of something I, I heard Michael Crow, the president of Arizona State, say in a recent uh, speech. He used a word I've never heard, phileo-pietism. Anybody else hear this? Mm -hmm. 
it's excessive, the definition is excessive reverence for tradition. And, and I think uh, he did a great job of, of highlighting the point that a lot of times I think we, we just are stuck in the past, and I think a lot of these arguments reveal that. Uh, absolutely not. I, I think uh, when you get to the issue of content creation, which yeah. that's been one of the major shifts in our students of today, they're into creating content. They create it every day on Facebook. And, and to sit in a, in a static environment where we're merely, they're, we're asking them to be consumers of content, which, which is more rigorous, to be a consumer or a creator. Uh, I can give you a hundred examples of right. where the embracing technology as an enabler forces students. We don't, we don't live in a logocentric world anymore uh, where we're, we're merely left to the, to the written and the oral word to describe things. We, we have to add this dimension of, of you know, the digital component, the ability to think in, in multifaceted ways in our students as early as kindergarten. I read something the other day, you talked about your kids, 53% uh, of, of kindergartners have a tablet experience before they go to kindergarten. Forty percent of all teens own a tablet device. Yeah. So I, I think that trying to Horses suggest the barn here, hasn't it? Yeah, I think trying to suggest that these are you know there's certainly criticisms and a lot of it goes in with how you structure the way in which you leverage technology is critical. But if you pay attention to these things, they're easily overcome. Easily overcome.